Beyond the Catholics, sex scandals ravage other world religions. He would work his way down to my genitals. <laughs> I know how pastors abuse power. This Tibet Lama was out for a quick lay. Williamsburg, Brooklyn is the spiritual center of several ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities. He would have nightmares or dreams about someone he called the Zipper Man. But what happens to these communities when a sexual scandal erupts? He would then motion for me to get on his lap while swiveling the chair, start touching me. He said that God will punish you if you tell. And since he's God's representative, what is a six or seven year old to do? And when somebody who is literally presented to you as God's representative on earth abuses you, for many of these people, it's as if the hand of God came down and abused you himself. If you follow the Talmud, you need to excommunicate people like this so that they cannot continue to do the evil that they've been perpetuating. These communities consider modesty in dress a sacred virtue. They are quiet, devout, keep to themselves. Most issues are within good hands in these insular communities, but with little or no access to secular authorities, they are vulnerable to the most pernicious sexual predators. A certain amount of sexual deviance is gonna be found in any society. What is really shocking is the extent of license that's been extended to these people to victimize children. And if you are a pedophile, the Orthodox Jewish community is one of the best places you can be. And a profession that brings you in constant contact with children is the perfect place for you to be. Joel Engelbaum was a member of the Satmar community. He went to this school as a child. When he was eight years old, he was abused by a rabbi who was principal of the school. The kid would come to the classroom, knock on the door, and say, Engelman, the principal wants to see you. He would tell me to close the door behind me. Uh, he would then motion for me to get on his lap. He would then work his way down and, and until he got to my genitals. And after about 15 minutes, he would say, OK, uh, you're good to go, but you won't tell your parents about this, will you? I remember it very clearly. He would go into his room, and he would lock himself in his room. My husband and I did talk to each other, and we said, what's wrong with Yoli? And my husband said, leave him alone. He's a teenager. He's going through a stage. Don't bother him. I would have constant flashbacks. Um, I would be depressed for long periods of time, not knowing why or not wanting to know. They're confused because they have been told that um, a religious person is going to set the standards for morality. So if this religious person or rabbi is saying to them, this is OK, um, then they will probably go, go along with what they're being asked to do. Amy Newstein is an Orthodox Jew and editor of a book, Tempest in the Temple. What outrages me most about pedophilia in the Orthodox Jewish community is the systematic cover-up by its leaders of the ongoing crimes perpetrated against innocent children. Rabbis who have a lot of influence in the community systematically intimidate and threaten abuse victims, their advocates, their supporters, and their therapists. The abuse victims are left with no support, and they're fighting a behemoth 
that is so strong, they don't know where to turn. It's blinding emotionally. The parents are confused. They want to support the child. They're horrified that this might have happened. They go to, to the rabbi of the community, who hopefully he's not the same rabbi who was abusing the child, and they ask the rabbi what to do. And all too often, the rabbi says to them, we'll take care of it. Uh, I'll talk to him. Don't talk about it anymore. Don't talk with the child. It's going to be Lashon uh, like evil tongue, if you speak about it with anybody else. And um, things are kind of hushed. And if their parents do speak up, it is the children who suffer the consequences. What happens is they won't be invited to go places with friends. They'll be just left alone and abandoned. That's a terrible thing to happen to a child. And if your whole life is insular and you don't have friends outside the Orthodox community, can you survive without friends? Can any human being survive in an isolated environment? It's a very eerie feeling, thinking of what is affecting me on a day-to-day -day basis had started in this building. It's a very saddening feeling, especially knowing that this teacher uh, is still with children today. Martin Levin is the book editor of the Globe and Mail. When he lived in Winnipeg, Ephraim Bricks, an Orthodox rabbi, was accused of molesting his son, Daniel. Rabbi Bricks denies all allegations, as does the school. I do remember um, going for a walk with him when he was about seven years old. And he said, I don't feel very good about myself. And I asked him why, and he said, not sure. But he was, uh, he was about eight years old. He would have nightmares or dreams about someone he called the zipper man. We could never figure out what it was, who the zipper man was. But in retrospect, I think it's fairly clear. Daniel gave a statement to the police and told his therapist what happened. What infuriated Martin Levin was that so many people came to the rabbi's defense. It surprised me how quiet people were able to keep it for a long time. You know, there were enablers. All these people have enablers of one sort or another, and people who are dubious, in fact, can't even believe in their guilt, and so um, will defend them. If you're kind of a closed community anyway, it's easy to circle the wagons, then they continue to be honored. When they disclose to their families, to society, to their religious communities, and we do nothing to stop the abuser, it's as if society and their communities have abandoned them as well, um, and that their disclosure and their own abuse was for naught, because they can't take the knowledge that uh, and bring it forward and protect anybody else from abusing them. So it is an incredible betrayal. Those who go to the civil authorities are often mocked and ridiculed. If uh, anyone goes to the authorities, they're seen as uh, anti-community. They're seen as musser, which means ratting out someone from the community, which is seen as a great offense. Rabbi Nachum Rosenberg set up a hotline to expose molesters and was almost killed for it. The parents of the victims, they're being thrown out from the community. It's a shame what's happening in our community. I was ostracized. I can show you the papers. The whole community was white with posters. In every Jewish newspaper, they had my name saying all bad things about me. Nobody should talk to me. I was followed by a person. He said, if you don't close your hotline, we're going to shoot at you. And I was hit. There was a big red stain. But because of the speed of the car, it didn't hit this way. It just grazed the brain and flew on onto the building. He is not allowed to pray in any Orthodox synagogue in Brooklyn. And on the Sabbath, he has to cross the bridge to Manhattan to find a synagogue that will let him in. Why do some of the rabbis feel so determined to silence the critics? To publicly expose what the abusers did is to reveal scandalous facts about the Orthodox community, which would better be left unpublicized. 
from their point of view, that's a sacrifice they'll make. To put it another way, the child victims are less important than the, than the image of the community as a whole. I was receiving threatening emails and, and all kinds of messages uh, challenging me because I was known as somebody who treated uh, individuals who were abused. And among the threats was, was the, the idea that it's something that shouldn't be spoken about because it's not likely to have, have happened. And by speaking about it, I'm giving credence to something that wasn't real. A lot of Jewish communities believe that we're not like everybody else. We are held to a higher standard, and we are, um, there's the, the righteousness in the sense that we, we have better morals than every, anybody else. We go by, by more stringent laws and, and requirements, from dietary laws to dress code to a lot of other things. So it can't, we're not like everybody else. It can't be happening in our communities. For many ultra-Orthodox sects, accusations like child abuse must be handled within the community by a rabbinical court comprised of at least three judges who will determine on the guilt or innocence. It's called a Beit Din, and going to the civil authorities is considered traitorous. Daniel Sosnowick, an Orthodox Jew and a captain in the NYPD, says the rabbinical council cannot deal with pedophiles. I do not believe that there's any Beit Din that has any of the credentials necessary to listen to, listen to witnesses, to interview actual crime victims, children crime victims. And again, there's usually no witnesses to this, so it's, it's usually a he said, he said type situation. And how do you, how do you go about interrogating under those circumstances and not further victimize them through inappropriate questioning. They'll get hung up on a question of fact, you know, where was the door in the hallway? Was it on the right side or the left side? Not taking into account that the child is not focused on the door being on the right side or the left side. This is a, a victim of trauma. Some of them actually believe that they have the ability to tell truth from falsehood by looking at a person's face. They truly believe this. And unfortunately, people have died because they truly believe this. Lakewood, New Jersey is the home of one of the largest rabbinical schools in the United States. There have been several charges of child molestation in the community. Many of the influential rabbis have urged the parents to let only the rabbinical councils deal with accusations of sexual abuse. Marlene Lynch Ford is the prosecutor for the county. The rabbinical tribunal does not have the same investigative tools that are available to us. They don't have the authority, um, subpoena power and so forth that is available to us uh, under the law. And, uh, and they don't frankly have the history and the tradition that we have of our ability to prosecute these types of cases. In one case, people who brought charges of molestation were harassed by threatening emails and text messages from members of the community. We felt that that met the criteria for witness tampering. Uh, we presented the case to the grand jury and in case the, uh, the grand jury um, indicted in that particular case, uh, which, uh, you know, obviously, one, we want to deter that conduct, and we also want to send a message to the community that retaliatory conduct against those who choose to bring to the secular authorities um, actions of uh, child abuse uh, or other criminal conduct, for that matter, uh, will be dealt with very severely. Often, after the charges of abuse are made, the story is still not over. And then the rabbis take it one step further by organizing ad hoc rabbinic courts to work on breaking the victim down. The victim is hauled before the rabbinic panel, and the victim is told that he or she is a liar. The victim is forced to sign a letter of recantation to be taken over to the district attorney so that the whole criminal justice process will collapse and the offender will walk scot-free. The rabbinic courts have that kind of preternatural power 
How do you explain that people who spend their whole life with holy books, who study what is the right and wrong way to live, behave so despicably? Some of the rabbis in the ultra-Orthodox community rationalize this kind of behavior. Um, I was with this rabbi, a um, very kind, um, caring individual. But the things he was saying, he was matter-of-factly telling me that everybody has these urges. And I, I asked him, are you saying that everybody has the urge to sexually abuse a child? He says, yes. He says, but us, us Hasidim, we know how to deal with these urges. We control them. And even if a Hasid sometimes errors and he sins, he works on himself. He's not going to do it again. When they're abusing a child, they're basically somehow justifying it to themselves that that is OK. It is not really coming from um, a religious place. It's coming from a compulsion place, from a, a sexual deviant place. Um, at that moment, I don't know that they can reconcile being religious and being abusive at the same time, even if they still sort of maintain the outside facade of a religious persona, even if well, while they're abusing. Um, I, that's the only way I can explain it. Sex offenders can look you straight in the eye and swear on the Torah, and they can lie to you, and they can do it convincingly. And so many of these communities believe when the religious leaders, when the rabbis say to them, I didn't do it, or if I did do it, I will never do it again. And what we find is that they go on to continue to, to offend against many, many children. How can a scholarly person that people revere do such acts to Daniel Levin? It's quite often that these people have developed a kind of persona, and they have, um, I won't necessarily call it charisma, but they have a kind of force. And I think the force might be developed out of an absence of empathy, that they can, they, but they can counterfeit emotions, they can counterfeit a kind of tremendous leadership view. And so, so, so many of these people seem to be trusted, seem to be regarded as community leaders. This is a disguise of some sort. It's a disguise that's been effective. Might be the only disguise he knows now. But it's also possible he sees himself as a righteous person. I have, you know, I, I, I can't, haven't really tried to penetrate that mind. In 1993, on the eve of Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, his son Daniel killed himself. The Rebbe who abused me is still teaching children every day. 14 years after he was molested, Joe Langelman finds out the rabbi is still teaching kids. Frustrated by what he sees as a lack of justice, he confronts him. The Rebbe who abused me is still teaching children every day. I'd like to talk about survivors and what they go through. He's transformed himself from a victim to a militant activist. He helped found a group, Survivors for Justice. His mother, Pearl, joined the cause. Parents, we need to protect our children. Please call your state senator today and ask them to vote for the Child Victims Act. Thank you. Joe was very brave. He's really, he's really a hero in our family. I still do have hope in my seeing you. Wonderful people here tonight. There is a breakthrough in the wall of silence. Now, there are community meetings publicly exposing stories of child abuse. The parents are starting to bring charges of molestation to the authorities. Yes, I thought this is normal. You got me molested. I went back for another two years. How many people have I met who said, yeah, I remember a, a, you know, a teacher or someone in the community who touched me, I remember and never did anything about it. So Even the state assemblyman is taking up the cause. Without showing you names, I will share things with you that will make you sick, that will cause you not to sleep if you don't think 
there is a real problem. With God's help, with Hashem's help, we will do everything in the world to make sure there are no more victims. People who report molestation, they're not bringing shame to the community. They are purging our community of an individual who is a predator and should be purged from our community as quickly and as directly as possible. There is still stiff resistance to bringing the predators to justice. Yeah, we have made progress. From one to ten, maybe one and a half. Maybe, I'm not sure. We have a long way to go.